some of these, um, I'm just going to say excuses, exceptional <laughs> hardship uh, circumstances um, do work. You know, people. Some people don't end up getting banned, uh, depending on you know how, how the judge views the case. Uh, Tristan, thank you very much. Let's speak to Nick Freeman, otherwise known as Mr. Loophole, a solicitor specialising in speeding and traffic offences, and he has worked with many high-profile clients. Hi, Nick. Good afternoon, Tina. Have you ever heard anything like this in terms of cases driving bans? Well, well, it, it's a surprising case. I mean, look, the argument. The, the arguments were surprising. Um, obviously, some of it was held in camera, so we don't know what was said there. We, we do know that he pleaded not guilty. I don't know what his defence was, but obviously he would lose credit um, for, for basically changing his plea on the day of the trial. Um, but when, when you get to this sort of situation, when you've got nine points and you're in danger of three more points, he, he was presumably charged with using a mobile phone, which is six points and also failing to comply with an automatic traffic signal, which is three points. So he's going to get at least six points. B before the courts consider a totting up ban, the, the sentencing guidelines actually direct them to consider a discretionary disqualification, which operates as an alternative to penalty points. Right. So they, they could have argued, his lawyer could have said, look, that there isn't exceptional hardship. You know, in my view, it, it was an incredibly difficult argue to its argument to establish exceptional hardship with someone who is worth a hundred million. Um, you know, you can have a chauffeur in the daytime, you can have a chauffeur at night, and, and really that's the end of the problem. Um, so I think that that argument was going to be incredibly difficult to run and win. You've got to establish it on the balance of probabilities, and the threshold is very, very high. You know. Real inconvenience is not enough. It's got to be exceptional hardship. So, as I say, it's a high threshold. But what the lawyers could have done, and I don't know whether they did this or not, is gone and said, look, well, they, they clearly didn't because I concede there's going to be enormous inconvenience. It doesn't quite reach the threshold of exceptional hardship. But please look at the sentencing guidelines. Would you consider a short period of disqualification? And that's the first thing the courts are directed to consider. And have they considered that? And granted it, he would have had maybe a 14, 28 day ban, which would, um, as an alternative to penalty points. So he would have been left with nine penalty points on his license, yeah. and he would have had a short ban, and he would have been able to perform his duties, which obviously is very important, at the conclusion of that disqualification. So that would be another way of approaching it. And I don't think, well, that clearly wasn't advanced in this case. I have no idea why not. Well, maybe um, you should have had yeah. you representing him. Well, I. I, I <laughs> Uh, well, I wasn't instructed, but, um, you know, I, I don't know why those arguments weren't advanced um, because they might have had considerably more success than trying to argue exceptional so hardship. So in but, um, your vast experience, Nick, you say the threshold is high. What excuses high. can mean you avoid that ban in court? You've worked with some very high-profile clients. Can you yeah. give us some examples of well, how people yeah. have avoided bans? Well, look, it's much more difficult for someone who has means. But I have argued for a very well-known footballer um, whose car actually was um, bugged. So he was followed by the paps all the time. So he argued that the, the, the for his own personal security, wherever he went, he was being followed. Uh, and he had seven points on his licence. He was going to get at least another five. Um, and the court were persuaded in that case... At, as, as could have happened here, to give him a short ban instead of imposing penalty points. But typically what happens is the court will say, look, if you're going to lose your job uh, and, you know, you don't have any private wealth and you're not going to be able to basically put food on the table, you're not going to be able to pay any of your expenses, it's going to have a catastrophic effect on your family uh, and those who, de who depend on you. The court in those circumstances will say, yes, there is exceptional hardship um, because Parliament intended people under those situations to have one more chance. Um, you argue it once in three years, that's it. Um, so that typically is probably the strongest argument. Um, or you can have a situation, for example, where you have um, a family member, member who is totally dependent upon you, who is, is ill. You, you um, have to look after that person um, every day. Uh, the person might live in a remote area. You don't have the means other than driving there yourself. Um, you may have a family who live in a, a rural location where there is no public transport and they need to ferry their kids to school. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what's more persuasive is the innocent victims who suffer. Um, as he, here, obviously, did you refer to um, his employees? 
But, you know, if he gets a driver, the employees aren't going to lose their job. So it, it, it's a slightly nebulous argument. But when you're talking about um, somebody who doesn't have the means and that is going to cause loss of jobs to other people, then the court rightly is persuaded to say, look, we're, we're, we're going to give you one more chance. Um, as I say, if you're, if you're worth 100 million, it's a very hard argument to run. Nick, thank you very much. Nick Freeman, a solicitor specialising in speeding and traffic offences. If you